Belarus ahead of the start of the 46th session of the UN Human Rights Council next week. Right at the start, I remind you that this meeting offers English and Russian interpretation. If you've not already done so, please select your language option at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And if you'd like to take the floor later, uh, please indicate this in the chat box. I'm Matthew Jones, working with the Human Rights House Foundation, and together with the Permanent Mission of Denmark and the many states and NGOs who have co-sponsored this meeting, we're grateful for your participation at a critical moment in Belarus's human rights situation. We're also aware that delegations are very busy with preparations for the session, and while we have a number of speakers today, I'll aim to finish promptly at the hour mark. Many of you will be aware of the serious developments taking place even just in the last few days in Belarus. I will leave it to other colleagues to speak of these developments in detail, but I also want to highlight that the report of the High Commissioner was published yesterday, following an urgent debate at its 45th session. The Human Rights Council mandated the High Commissioner to report in detail on the human rights situation in Belarus in the context of the presidential elections. While the report doesn't cover recent serious events for obvious logistical reasons, it does provide us with a clear understanding as to why Belarus faces this current crisis. I urge you to take the time to read this report when you're able to. Before introducing our strong panel, we will hear brief opening remarks from the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Denmark. While the report doesn't cover recent serious events for obvious logistical reasons, Uh, and we just switch to the statement. Our strong panel, we will hear brief opening remarks. I welcome Minister today's Foreign opportunity Affairs. to address the grave human rights situation in Belarus. The Belarusian authorities have committed serious and unprecedented human rights violations in the wake of the contested presidential elections. This is documented in the Moscow Mechanism Report by the OSCE Rapporteur Professor Benedek and reported by international and Belarusian civil society organizations and the media. There are no signs that human rights violations have stopped, rather to the contrary. The Belarusian authorities have ensured widespread impunity through their uh, reluctance to investigate and prosecute the numerous reported cases of violence and torture committed by the authorities. Despite our repeated calls to end the campaign of violence and repression, Despite our repeated calls to hold all perpetrators of human rights violations accountable, I commend the Belarusian civil society, journalists and media for their courageous effort to document the brutality of the Belarusian authorities. These are crucial contributions to the effort aiming at restoring justice in Belarus. To address the dire need for accountability, we as international community must do our utmost to support the people of Belarus in achieving justice. The Human Rights Council needs to do its part in seeking to ensure accountability and preventing a further deterioration of human rights situation. We continue to stand in solidarity with the Belarusian people in their fight for their rights. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I now turn to the first of our panelists, the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in Belarus. Following a previous serious deterioration in the human rights situation in Belarus in the context of the 2010 presidential elections, the Human Rights Council first mandated the High Commissioner to provide recommendations on the situation. Then in 2012, it mandated a Special Rapporteur to report on the situation. Given that Belarus is not a member of a regional human rights organization like the Council of Europe, and given it rarely allows itself to be reviewed by a UN treaty body, for instance, it was reviewed by the Human Rights Committee for the first time in over 20 years in 2018, the mandate of the Special Rapporteur is a critical mechanism for the human rights situation in Belarus to receive regional and international attention. And the mechanism is essential for our civil society partners in Belarus. Sadly, Belarus continues its policy of non-cooperation with the mandate, and most of the recommendations made in the very first report of the Special Rapporteur remain relevant today. In fact, the report of the High Commissioner released yesterday says that the current situation, and I quote, reflects long-standing chronic patterns of systemic violations and impunity, 
which have been highlighted by various international human rights mechanisms, including the treaty bodies and the Special Rapporteur. Madam Special Rapporteur, we're really grateful for your participation today at very short notice, and in particular, given the acute issues arising just this week in Belarus. I would ask you if you could provide us with a brief update of the overall human rights situation in Belarus since you last addressed the council towards the end of 2020. Madam Special Rapporteur, you have the floor. Thank you, Matthew. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to this important side event. Uh, my remarks today will be brief and focus on three key points that I see particularly pertinent for Belarus today prior to the session at which the High Commissioner will present her own report on the situation. For many years, the human rights situation in Belarus has been problematic and has raised serious concerns. Yet what happened in 2020 led to unprecedented human rights violations, both in terms of scope and scale. Over 30,000 people were detained just because they tried to exercise their legal right to freedom of assembly. Thousands were allegedly tortured or otherwise subject to ill treatment, psychological intimidation and threats. Hundreds of activists, human rights defenders, journalists were persecuted or were subjected to various forms of pressure by the authorities. These human rights violations affected nearly all categories of society, men and women, pensioners and children, university professors and teachers and their students and pupils, but also of course lawyers, medical staff, businessmen, artists. Thus, and this is the first point I would like to emphasize, the human rights violations in Belarus have been massive and affect the whole spectrum of civil society actors and organizations. I would like to remind that in this context and since the beginning of May 2020, that is since the beginning of the current period of escalation of human rights offenses in Belarus, the Human Rights Committee has registered 40 cases and has more than 200 applications that are under consideration. As far as I know, this is the highest rate of appeals to the Human Rights Committee for any country. Most of the complaints about Belarus to the committee refer to violations falling under Article 19 and 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That is to say the right to freedom of opinion and expression and the right to freedom of peaceful assembly, respectively. <clears throat> the problem is not only the extent of human rights violations, mass detentions with a disproportionate use of force, beatings, torture, threats and intimidation, but also the atmosphere of impunity in which they occur. And this is my second point. From the facts and figures communicated to us, it is clear that the state machinery, the law enforcement bodies, the judiciary, the court system, the legislative framework, not only do not provide adequate protection for the enjoyment of human rights, but now it seems to be used as a means for repression. The authorities have not communicated any statistics on the number of perpetrators of human rights violations who were brought to justice following the accusations of victims of police brutality or torture in detention. Why? Because from what we know, no court proceedings have been opened yet on any of these cases. This comes to prove that impunity is a systemic problem embedded deep inside the state machinery in Belarus. Thirdly, and even though the human rights situation has changed from bad to worse in recent months, my main concern now is that it continues to deteriorate as we speak. As you have noticed, the authorities have remained deaf to all our calls and recommendations of the past six months. I haven't seen any step made in the right direction, quite to the contrary. In recent weeks, there has been a multiplication of evidence that the authorities seem to want to further tighten the screws, probably ahead of the spring, when the protests will predictably resume with even more determination. Whereas before, the authorities were punishing people for exercising their legitimate rights to peaceful assembly by bringing administrative charges against them. 
and subjecting them to heavy fines. Now, there are more criminal charges brought against participants in peaceful protests and those who defend them. According to various sources, there are almost 250 people in Belarus sentenced on allegedly politically motivated charges. Let me remind that hundreds more are expecting trial. There is a clear trend towards criminalizing the activities of those who protect human rights. On 16th of February, two days ago, the authorities conducted mass raids on the offices of Vyasna Human Rights Center, the Belarusian Association of Journalists and independent trade unions. Dozens of civil society activists were interrogated and some had their homes searched too. I remind that each time these searches happen, the, uh, the computers and, and um, phones of these people are seized and returned after months, if not more. These people will not have the possibility to work in coming days because of this. These raids took place not only in Minsk, but in other big cities of Belarus. Apparently, the authorities justified their actions by aiming at establishing, I quote, the circumstances of the financing of protest activities in the context of Article 342 of the Criminal Code that con condemns the organization and preparation of actions that grossly violate public order, unquote. This adds to the continuous judicial harassment of human rights lawyers and human rights defenders that in intensified since the beginning of 2021. I think in particular about Leonid Sudalyanka and his colleagues who were paying the fines of the arrested protesters. Other organizations have been targeted for the same reasons, notably the Office for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, whose director, Sergei Drozdowski, was interrogated and placed under house arrest. These people face criminal charges for allegedly organizing or financing illegal protests. In the same vein, whereas state propaganda presents the protesters as terrorists on a foreign payroll, accusing neighboring countries of training or manipulating them, uh, hosting exiled politicians who are now accused of planning a coup d'etat, etc. Um, in this context, this morning, two Belsat journalists were condemned to two years in prison. They had been in custody since November when they were covering the popular gatherings on so-called square of changes that were prompted by the announcement of the death of Raman Bandarenka. These young, brave women were only doing their job. Since August, it had become an increasingly dangerous one. Plenty of independent journalists said they felt like working in a war zone. <clears throat> no journalist, <clears throat> excuse me from independent media was accredited to follow their trial and no colleague of theirs could enter the courtroom during the hearings to support them. Only state journalists were let in. This illustrates a trend which I see as very worrying and which I am afraid will be my fourth point at the next side event on Belarus in July, if nothing is done to stop this trend. Belarus, in my view, is in the process of being turned into a wide concentration camp, isolated from the rest of the world. So I would like to use this opportunity to strongly condemn these actions by the authorities, which add to the overall atmosphere of fear in the country. And once again, I call upon the international community to do its utmost to help people and hopefully change this trend. Thank you. Thank you, Special Rapporteur. And I understand that this meeting has actually uh, reached its maximum number of participants. Um, if you are aware of colleagues who would want to follow along to this meeting, um, they can watch via HRHF's YouTube channel. We're streaming live there as well. Um, we'll come back to several of the issues that uh, you've touched on, Madam Special Rapporteur, with other speakers. Our next speaker needs no introduction. Former Belarusian presidential candidate Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya has addressed a number of United Nations related audiences. She of course spoke to us during the Human Rights Council's urgent debate on Belarus back in September, and among other engagements has addressed an ARIA formula meeting of the UN Security Council towards the end of January. Ms. Tikhanovskaya, thank you for joining us today. 
When you spoke to us in September, you said that Belarus was in clear violation of international norms and its human rights obligations. What is your assessment since then? And what do you think should be the role of the Human Rights Council in addressing the situation as you see it? Ms. Tikhanovskaya, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, dear Minister, dear UN Special Rapporteur, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to speak in front of you. We gathered today because the human rights situation in Belarus is critical and it is getting worse day by day. When we think that a new uh, low point has been reached, a new wave of human rights abuses overwhelms Belarus. If we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, almost every single right spelled out has been violated by the Belarusian government. There are 255 political prisoners in Belarusian prisons today with over 1,000 people targeted by criminal cases during the election campaign in the post-election period. We call for uh, the immediate and unconditional release. First, they came for presidential candidates and political activists. Then they came for lawyers. Now they came for human rights defenders and journalists. And they are also coming for any Belarusians every day. But we will not be silent and we will not stop denouncing what is happening. Two days ago, a wave of searches of human rights defenders' homes and offices took place. This wave spread throughout the country to the regional centers and smaller towns. Belarusian Association of Journalists and Human Rights Center Visna were at the center of this repressive campaign. Those very organizations have been on the front line uh, of providing legal assistance and defending the freedom of expression. The authorities are trying to tarnish their reputation by accusing them of financing the protests and that they are involved in extremist activities. There is no line the regime is not ready to cross. And it is not a Coincidence that last week, Marfa Rabkova, coordinator of the Visna Volunteer and Savers, faced additional criminal charges. Under the new charges, Marfa Rabkova faces up to 12 years in prison. The smear campaign in the state media is just another element of this disgraceful attack on human rights defenders. We stand by Marfa Rabkova, Alice Belyatsky, Valentin Stefanovich and Visna for Human Rights. Belarusian Association of Journalists is an extremely or is an um, exemplary organization that was awarded the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought in 2004 for protecting journalists working under the threat of harassment, intimidation, and persecution. We stand by Boris Goretsky, Alek Augeyev and the Belarusian Association of Journalists for Freedom of Expression. Telling the truth doesn't go unpunished in Belarus, as Katerina Andreeva and Daria Chultsova have learned today. They were sentenced to two years in prison just a couple of hours ago. They have been imprisoned for reporting live from a peaceful rally with people protesting against the killing of Roman Bandarenka by Lukashenko's cronies. And I'm saddened that neither the UN High Commissioner, Commissioner for Human Rights, no special rapporteur on Belarus's human rights situation has had access to the country since August 2020. However, I'm not surprised. But nevertheless, we need to make sure that the UN uses all available tools and mechanisms uh, to put an end to the impunity within the government and special forces. I call for an independent, impartial and transparent international investigation of the grave human rights abuses.
The UN mechanisms and uh, OSCE Moscow mechanism should align the efforts in this direction. It's time for accountability. All the perpetrators should be brought to justice for the peaceful transition to take place. Belarus has obligations under international human rights law, but it has ignored the Human Rights Council and High Commissioner's recommendations for years. It is outrageous that Belarus is one of the UN founding members, but it disregards this system's very foundations. Belarusians want the Declaration of Human Rights and other human rights obligations to be duly applied. We should start with Article 21. The will of the people shall be the basis of the government authority. What is happening in the moment is not based on the will of the people. And Belarusians want their freedom and dignity back. Belarusians demand new elections. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tukunaitskaya. I've had the privilege to get to know Belarusian civil society in recent years, including with a few visits to Minsk. Our Belarusian colleagues are wonderful. They're brave. They continue to do good work, often in the face of serious challenges, and always with the threat of reprisals for their work, including criminal sanctions. However, the targeting of some of the most respected human rights organizations in the country this week, including Vyazna and Belarusian Association of Journalists, and the detention and arrest of many of our partners has been shocking, even if colleagues knew it was likely. In addition, we are now seeing, as you've heard, colleagues from organizations like the Office of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities being criminally investigated for their cooperation with the United Nations Office in Minsk. Such developments are a serious and new deterioration in the situation. Our next speaker is a key figure in Belarusian civil society. Alech Hulak is the president of the Belarusian Helsinki Committee and has also been the coordinator of the National Elections Monitoring Mission in Belarus, an independent NGO-led coalition to monitor the presidential election. Mr. Hulak, your position has afforded you an important perspective on the crisis. What is your view on recent events in Belarus? And in particular, if you can give us more details of the increased targeting of human rights organizations in the last two weeks and your assessment of these developments. Mr. Hulak, you have the floor. Спасибо, Мэтью, за представление. Действительно, очень важная тема и очень важно, очень важно, что мы сейчас можем об этом говорить и привлекать внимание к этим проблемам, с которыми сталкивается и страна, и правозащитное сообщество. Действительно, коллеги уже рассказали о том, что вот буквально последние дни стали такими, пробили, как, 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 что называется, пробили очередное дно в ситуации, которая, казалось, уже и так дошла до предела. Но я бы я хотел обратить внимание на то, что не только, не только мы столкнулись с этими масштабными, масштабными обысками у правозащитных организаций, журналистов, профсоюзов, но вчера мы увидели, что милицейские власти этим даже бравируют. Раньше они как бы как, ну, такую информацию еще нужно было поискать. А сейчас они демонстративно показывают, что да, вот они провели порядка 90 обысков за один день, нашли у правозащитников и у значит, союзников, у журналистов, нашли в общей сумме 80 тысяч долларов, эквивалент в разных валютах. Это, это значит, что людей забрали деньги, которые были у них дома, и это по тысяче, на, по, по тысяче на обыск. Извините меня, это никоим образом не тянет на какое-то на какое финансирование, но на то, чтобы лишить людей денег, за которые они сейчас живут, это вполне, вполне тянет. Вот. И также для того, чтобы очернить в глазах, в их понимании, 
очернить активистов. Значит, милиционеры указывают, что изъяли литературу, пропагандирующую ЛГБТ-отношения и всякие другие страшилки. Также нас, также нас тревожит то, что вменяется патрон, ну, огнестрельное оружие, которое в нашей истории уже были попытки внедрения, обвинения активистов в в использовании, в хранении огнестрельного оружия. Вот. И посмотрим, как будет развиваться события. Но это очень тревожный звонок. Это значит, что кому-то из, кому из тех людей, кого, у кого были обыски, из гражданских активистов будет вменяться более тяжелая статья и будут вот эти страшилки с огнестрельным оружием. Также очень важно отметить, что это не, обыски не просто обыски. Обыски это значит, к вам в 7 утра ломятся э, в квартиру, пока вы еще в постели и в трусах, извините, э, и, потом, и потом пугают всякими, э, всякими страшилками, что вы не доживете до вечера, и где вы встретите следующий день, это, это тоже будет тюрьма, и, ну, и, и весь набор страшилок, это все для того, чтобы люди перестали прекратили свою правозащитную или журналистскую деятельность. Это, это как бы новый, новый виток, новый шаг в ситуации в Беларуси. Это, очевидно, расправа за то, что правозащитники помогали тем людям, которые преследовались, а также зачистка, очевидно, зачистка перед весенними событиями, которые сами власти уже характеризовали, что они ожидают войну и готовы к войне. Вот. И очевидно, это в их понимании уже такие военные действия, поэтому так они и действуют. Я обращаю внимание на то, что до сегодняшнего дня пока явно недостаточно дано оценок этим действиям, и вот начиная с наших коллег еще Андрея Александрова, Судаленко, Леонида, которых задержали еще уже несколько недель назад, и их обвиняли, началось, вот с них началось обвинение в том, что помощь людям является, рассматривается властями как соучастие в преступной деятельности. Очень важно, чтобы ООН, все его институты дали четкую, четкую оценку того, что это правомерная правозащитная деятельность. И такое преследование однозначно противоречит стандартам и международным обязательствам Беларуси, как члена Организации Объединенных Наций. Мне кажется, что... вот наглость, не побоим, ну, именно такое слово можно употребить, с которой действуют э, сейчас э, органы, называемые правоохранительными, э, она требует просто очень принципиальной оценки. Политические действия – это один момент, но вот принципиальная оценка, которая, она должна быть очень четко и однозначно высказана, в том числе для того, чтобы потом уже на нее могли ссылаться и Адвокаты, которые будут представлены в деле. Я также хочу обратить ваше внимание на то, что обыски это не конец. По результатам обысков будут, будут сделаны какие-то выводы. У людей изъяли технику, у людей изъяли документы. Они это все потом будут компилировать свои какие-то выводы и мы можем ожидать что через неделю примерно мы получим новую волну уже действий действий уголовного характера против активистов то есть это 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 на этом дело явно не остановится поэтому я еще раз призываю к активному противодействию этим масштабным репрессиям спасибо Thank you, Mr. Hulak. And uh, we may return to some of the issues you've raised um, towards the end if we have time. Next, we turn to another important member of Belarusian civil society, Victoria Fedorova, who is chair of legal initiative, which focuses on rule of law and promotion and protection of human rights. Ms. Fedorova, the report of the High Commissioner that was published yesterday 
identifies the large scale violence used by security forces against peaceful demonstrators in Belarus and their widespread use of torture and gender and sexual based violence. Your organization has been crucial in helping to document such cases. Can you provide us with an update on torture and gender based violence in Belarus? In addition, the High Commissioner, the Special Procedures and the Human Rights Council through Resolution 45-1 called on Belarus to initiate an independent investigation into allegations of violence and torture being employed by the security services and to bring to justice the perpetrators of such acts. Can you give us an update on Belarus's response to this, if any? Ms. Fedorova, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to speak and to give you uh, update on the situation with torture and investigation of torture in Belarus. First of all, according to official data uh, of investigative committee, uh, only in August, more than 700 citizens filed application on torture in official state bodies. And uh, in September, we, we know about uh, uh, 1,000 uh, 800 torture complaints, which are officially considered by the investigative committee. Uh, our organization uh, have documented more than 900 uh, torture testimonies, and we still uh, continue to interview victims. Uh, there is still no information about the initiation of criminal cases on the facts of torture. Victims uh, receive only notice of ext extension of uh, inspection time. Uh, little is known about the progress of such in investigation and inspections. Uh, in accordance with the criminal procedure code, the inspection period was three months with possibility to uh, extension for another three months. Nevertheless, on January 13 okay. this year, criminal procedure was amended and uh, updated legislation provide uh, for possibility to suspend the inspection for a period exceeding three months while there is no maximum period for such investigation. So now legislation uh, makes it possible to legally conduct an inspections for indefinite period without making any procedural decision. Uh, we as human rights defenders believe that this uh, uh, decision of uh, amendments in legislation because no one wants to uh, make decision on this uh, mass and systemic torture. Uh, also on August 96, uh, the General Prosecutor Office announced that uh, some kind of uh, interstate uh, commission on investigation of torture were created, but we still don't have any information about activity of such commission, about results of uh, their work, and uh, no information is Available. And uh, uh, these uh, facts indicate that uh, current investigation uh, do not meet the standards of effective investigation of allegation. All this information about beatings and torture with the testimonies of uh, a hundred of victims began to appear in August. Not a single criminal case can be initiated against uh, law enforcement officers so far. Even more, uh, no Lukashenko, no general prosecutor office, uh, no uh, any official uh, person uh, has uh, issued a single public uh, and unequivocal statement condemning acts of torture. Uh, nor they have issued a clear warning for any person involved in such actions will be uh, responsible uh, for these actions according to criminal court. On the contrary, according to recording of the country's deputy uh, interior minister Karpinkov, published by the Alexander authorized the Belarusian security forces to use lethal force against the position members and protesters and create concentration camps for protesters. 
uh, situation with uh, conditions of detentions now still not very good because uh, according to interviews with uh, released from detention centers at the Kresina and Jordina, there are no safety and sanitation measures were taken in connections with COVID. And also people uh, continue to be held in overcrowd cells. Uh, they sleep without uh, sleeping accessories. And in January, reception of parcels with food and with uh, warm clothes uh, at the all three detention centers was prohibited, allegedly in order to prevent the spread of COVID in Belarus. Uh, we believe the legality of such decision is extremely controversial and rather looks like uh, a deliberate deterioration of situation for persons who uh, held in this institution. Talking about gender-based violence, according to interview of uh, women uh, who were detained in August and also in autumn, threat of sexual violence perceived as real, noted by a large number of women uh, interviewed by our organization. Uh, these uh, threats uh, uh, at all stages uh, during detention, in the places of detention, and all of these women uh, perceive these uh, threats as real because they uh, they uh, saw what kind of a being in front of women. Uh, all places of detention violate the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, and numerous acts of violence apply, apply to women during their detention, as well as during their delivery and detention in places of detention, due to their mass and systematic nature, fall under the jurisdiction of Article 128 of Criminal Code of Belarus, Crimes Against Humanity, and also violate the Convention Against Torture and also Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And I also want to uh, uh, say some words about these cases because the uh, human rights community is aware at least of four cases of uh, deaths uh, directly connected with the protests. On the fact of the killing of Gennady Shutov and Alexander Tarajkovsky, no criminal cases have been initiated since August. Uh, on February 16, it became known about the refusal to initiate a criminal of Alexander Lajkomil temporary detention Facility. According to the official version of the investigative committee, no one is guilty of his death, of death of young men, uh, and death occurred due to suddenly aggravated disease of the cardiovascular system. Today, it became known that General Prosecutor Office opened a criminal the fact of death of Raman Banu uh, in the uh, hospital next night. According to General Prosecutor Office, the involvement of law, law enforcement officers uh, hasn't been established. So this is no doubt national those response and killings of peaceful people of Belarus held no violation against persecution for political reasons with official uh, I think unfortunately we've lost um, Ms Federova uh, I thank you for your intervention um, there were some uh, um, internet connection issues which I apologize for but we certainly heard sure. um, <laughs> most of your message uh, finally, I turn to Hanna Lubakova, a Belarusian journalist who, as well as being prolific on social media, and um, I certainly recommend you follow her on Twitter if you are not already doing so, has also been reporting on the situation in Belarus since long before the current human rights crisis. Part of the challenge that the Human Rights Council faces in addressing the human rights situation in Belarus is the tireless work of the Belarusian state to stop information about the human rights situation reaching Geneva. It does not allow the special rapporteur to visit the country. It has turned off the internet on various occasions. And it is mercilessly targeting independent journalists as referenced in the High Commissioner's report. 
We have just heard, of course, of two female journalists working for the Belsat TV channel in Belarus who have been sentenced to two years in a penal colony. Ms. Lubakova, what is your assessment of the situation of media freedom in Belarus in light of recent events? What does the Human Rights Council need to know that Belarus is trying to stop us from hearing? Ms. Lubakova, you have the floor. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for organizing this important event. Um, we have talked today about the unbelievable level of repressions against nearly every social, professional and age group in the country. But let me show you Belarus in a slightly different way, uh, because there is something else that uh, gives me hope. It is this people's courage, resilience and strength. Uh, indeed, we have uh, heard a few times uh, today the two-year sentence of uh, Katerina Andreeva and Daria Chilsova. Um, it was mentioned by, by the speakers. Uh, they were charged with the organization of uh, public actions that grossly violate uh, 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 public order. It is still unclear for me um, how journalists while live streaming can organize a protest. But what was not mentioned is that these two young female reporters uh, were in a cage during the court hearing. And they were smiling and showing victory signs even when they heard their sentence. The situation with uh, press freedom in Belarus has never been um, easy, has never been optimistic. The regime has kept independent media in the crosshairs for years. Last year, however, a real war has been unleashed against independent journalists and bloggers in Belarus. They were detained 480 times and jointly spent nearly four years in prison. There are currently 11 journalists who remain behind bars. There are also bloggers who are jailed. Security forces shot Natalia Lubnyowska, a national correspondent, with rubber bullets, even though she uh, had a press vest and uh, clearly identified herself as a journalist. When I was reporting from the streets of Minsk, I had to run myself from riot police and avoid stun grenades. I was not sure whether I have to um, um, mark myself as a journalist because I would have been targeted even more. It is lawlessness. Every day when I was in Minsk reporting, I was not sure whether I would come back home. So just in case, I had spare t-shirts in my backpack, which I might need in a detention center. Knowing all this, Katerina and Daria went to report from a demonstration. It is courage, it is dedication to their profession. Knowing all this, Igor Losik, prominent blogger, my friend, Radio Free Europe consultant, was manage managing his popular Telegram channel from inside the country. He was arrested in June and never got out of prison, despite being on a hunger strike for 42 days. He could have died but the regime didn't even react to his hunger strike. Knowing all this, members of the Belarusian Association of Journalists continue helping their colleagues in Belarus. Two days ago, as was mentioned by the speakers, the Bash office in Minsk and its members' apartment across the country were searched. Despite that, they keep working. They say, our colleagues have been arrested. We cannot stop. The same is true for other media organizations, such as Press Club, which directors and uh, founders uh, have, uh, have been arrested and they face criminal charges. Dozens of websites and media outlets were blocked, such as RFRL, Cuckoo Org, Euro Radio, and more. So knowing all this, they keep working. They continue working as best as they can because citizens have the right to receive information. Lukashenko's regime violates this one of the most important rights violates freedom of expression. It is thanks to journalists and the bloggers that the world knows what is happening in Belarus. So it is our ob obligation to protect them. International organizations and individual states should take responsibility for solving the crisis in Belarus. It is crucial to prevent impunity and launch an investigative mechanism that would collect evidence about the regime's crimes. There should be tangible and concrete steps by the international community to ensure dialogue and new and fair elections. Otherwise, I'm afraid if next time, perhaps it's July, as, as was mentioned by Anais, if experts gather for another hearing, we would have no one left in Belarus who could speak up, given the level of repressions against human rights defenders and journalists. Thank you, Ms. Lubakova. 
Um, and that completes uh, the lineup of panelists that we have. Um, we have a few minutes left for interventions. And I know, I think almost all of our uh, co-sponsors want to intervene. We unfortunately won't have time for all of them, but I will shortly turn um, uh, to the permanent mission of Lithuania, followed by Germany, and we'll see how far we get. Um, I just want to first take this moment to thank our co-sponsors of today's meeting on behalf of Human Rights House Foundation and the Permanent Mission of Denmark, including the International Commission of Jurists, Article 19, FIDH and Amnesty International, as well as the permanent missions in Geneva of Norway, Lithuania, Germany, the UK, the United States, and the permanent delegation of the European Union. Um, now, if we just have a few minutes, I'd like to first turn to uh, the permanent mission of Lithuania. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, many sincere thanks uh, to the Human Rights House Foundation and to the Permanent Mission of Denmark for initiating and convening this timely event in the run-up to, to the 46th session of the Human Rights Council. Lithuania has been proud to sponsor this event, uh, and we are very happy to have been able to facilitate uh, through the Freedom House Lithuania the attendance uh, by the former presidential uh, candidate Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya. Uh, I'm taking the floor to second the uh, call by uh, Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, but also by, by Professor Benedict, who produced the report of the OEC uh, Moscow mechanism uh, on the human rights violations in the context of Belarusian presidential elections. Uh, first, uh, for a new uh, free and fair presidential election in Belarus, and second, for, for a comprehensive uh, international, independent, impartial investigation uh, of the human rights violations uh, and abuses that occurred. Uh, the upcoming session of the Human Rights Council has a role in that respect. We, we will be discussing uh, what follow up the Human Rights Council should give uh, to the September resolution, which mandated the report by the Human Rights, uh, uh, by the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, which has just been published. Uh, and in our opinion, uh, the situation uh, has been deteriorating in Belarus since August, uh, and therefore the Human Rights Council uh, should create a very robust accountability mechanism that will be put in charge uh, of uh, creating, uh, of collecting and systematizing uh, evidence of human rights abuses for future uh, persecution of the perpetrators. Only this will send the sufficient and the relevant signal both to the de facto authorities in Belarus uh, that we cannot put up with the situation and with what is going on in the uh, human rights area in Belarus and on the other hand to the civil society of Belarus, which made us proud uh, by not relenting on their demands for freedom and democracy. Uh, six months have passed since the rigged presidential election, but people are still going out to the streets to protest and to claim their rights. So uh, 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 many thanks to all speakers uh, and um, all the best, the best of success in this important ongoing struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And uh, now we'll turn to the permanent mission of Germany, um, followed by the permanent mission of the United States, if we have time. Uh, do we have the permanent mission of Germany? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Please go thank ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I would like to pay respect to the Belarusian civil society, the activists, the journalists, the opposition politicians who are standing up for democracy and human rights, standing up in the face of hor horrific threats by the regime. Their courage and perseverance deserve our greatest admiration. Um, you're asking me to start my video, okay. Um, let me assure you, Germany and the European Union um, are with you, um, are, are supporting these acts of legitimate opposition. Um, as we have uh, heard, we need to do, we need to do, to do more. We have imposed sanctions against Lukashenko and his regime. We have set up an action plan, civil society Belarus, with uh, 21 million euros. But more needs to be done. And as my Lithuanian colleague has just said, um, impunity and the lack of accountability are issues that we have to 
uh, find a response to. And this is why the European Union will present a resolution in this upcoming Human Rights Council session to focus on accountability and mechanisms um, to fight uh, impunity. Of course, in the end, the respect for human rights can only be achieved from within Belarus. It will need a strong civil society and courageous people who stand up for the rights of all Belarusians. And we, are, we intend to support that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we next turn to the permanent mission of the United States, followed by the United Kingdom. At the United States, you have the floor. Thank you. I want to first extend my gratitude to the permanent mission of Denmark and the Human Rights House Foundation for organizing today's event. We welcome the opportunity to join the many other co-sponsors in addressing the deteriorating human rights crisis in Belarus. The United States remains deeply troubled by the Lukashenko regime's violent crackdown on peaceful protesters, including the reports we heard today of torture and other ill treatment its continued detention of over 200 political prisoners and others unjustly held, and its refusal to engage in genuine dialogue with civil society, including the Coordination Council. The High Commissioner's recent report and the shocking accounts from today's panelists further underscore the need for the Human Rights Council act to act to ensure accountability for the Belarusian uh, people. We are also disturbed by reports of Belarusian security services raiding the homes and offices of dozens of journalists, labor activists, religious leaders, and human rights defenders over the last two days. Uh, so my question for the panelists is what more can we at the Human Rights Council do to better Belarusian civil society, particularly in light of these recent crackdowns that we've discussed today? Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll turn to the permanent mission of the United Kingdom. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the Human Rights House Foundation and Denmark for organizing today's important and timely event, which the UK is pleased to co-sponsor. I also want to extend a warm thank you to all the panelists for your thought-provoking statements and to express particular appreciation to the civil society representatives for your attendance today in such difficult circumstances and for the clear messages you have set out on the situation in your country. The UK Foreign Secretary issued a joint statement with the Canadian Foreign Minister yesterday, condemning the recent appalling and targeted raids by the authorities on civil society organizations, human rights defenders, and independent journalists across Belarus. This is a further assault on civil society, human rights and liberties in a country which has faced extraordinary oppression from the Lukashenko regime. We remain deeply concerned by the continuing reports of torture and cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. Last year, the UK, with partners, invoked the OSCE Moscow mechanism to launch an independent investigation into the violations. We believe the Human Rights Council needs to take further action to ensure a comprehensive investigation into all human rights violations. Thank you, Matthew. Back over to you. Uh, thank you. And um, that's, that's all we have time for. But I, and, um, so I want to just make a, a final few words um, before we conclude. And apologies to those who still wanted to make statements. Um, but given uh, our push for time, we're going to have to conclude there. Um, so the Human Rights Council will address Belarus in enhanced interactive dialogue next week. Your assessment will be needed of whether Belarus is in a position to implement the recommendations of the High Commissioner, given a decade of non-engagement with the High Commissioner's reports, with the reports of the Special Rapporteur, and with non-compliance with the recommendations of the treaty bodies. If your conclusion is that Belarus is unlikely to implement these critical recommendations in the report that we've received from the High Commissioner yesterday, it will be up to you to decide what the next steps should be. We and our Belarusian civil society colleagues are looking to you, Human Rights Council member states and observers, 
to assist and aid a process that will ultimately lead to accountability for the serious violations that are occurring in the country. It's a critically important moment for Belarus and very important that the Human Rights Council stands with the Belarusian people at this moment. I remind delegations that the Human Rights House Foundation, as well as co-sponsoring NGOs, remain open to providing independent further information to you in order that you can make good and informed decisions in the coming weeks on Belarus. I finish by thanking all of our panelists. Thank you very much, and particularly that you're available today at relatively short, short notice, and particularly given um, the, the, the acute challenges that uh, you are facing in Belarus this week. I thank the Permanent Mission of Denmark as a co-organizer and all of the co-sponsors again. I also thank our interpreters for their hard work. I wish you all a good day and I wish the Human Rights Council and all of the missions that will be engaging with the Council's work a successful session. Thank you. Thank you.